Hi there and welcome to Where's the Money Gone, a podcast about football finance, governance and politics. This time, never mind five defeats in a row, Manchester City have also lost in a big clash with the Premier League over what are called associated party transactions, which would have made it easier for their oil state owners to subsidise the club. APTs are rules designed to ensure that any commercial deals linked to their owners, are assessed at fair market value so that they can't get around spending limits by subsidising the club through the back door. We'll also be looking again at the Football Governance Bill, which has started its journey through Parliament. I've been digging deep into the document from more than 20 years ago when football was given a two-year deadline to get its house in order. That worked, didn't it? Hello, I'm Adrian Goldberg. I'm an investigative journalist and West Bromwich Albion's season ticket holder, joined, as usual, by Charlie Methven. Charlie is Charlton Athletics Chief Executive, former director of Sunderland, boyhood Oxford United fan, and a man who has given professional advice to both Arsenal and Spurs. And, Charlie, before we talk about APTs and the Football Governance Bill, are we skating over the weekend's performance? Like Charlton Athletic, a two-one yes. defeat at Uddersfield. Well, it, it was. I mean, it's taken in isolation. It was a gallant two-one defeat from Huddersfield after playing with ten men for sixty-five minutes um, and missing two very good chances um, late in the second half to equalise. Um, but of course, unfortunately, it does extend a, a run of games without a victory, which is causing Charlton to slide down the table. How are the baggies getting on? Well, we drew 2-2 in a very entertaining, exciting game against Norwich City. Either side could have won it, really. We've had a spate of nil-nil draws at home. And 2-2, I have to say, was a big improvement on that. If you're going to only get a point from a game, then at least make it entertaining. And this was entertaining, I have to say, richly so. And uh, I took one of my daughter's uh, teammates from her football team to her first ever game with her mom, so hopefully we've got another baggy added to the Albion family. So these APTs then, Charlie, there was a lot of talk about this Manchester City threatening, as they always seem to do, legal action on associated party transfers. But what the Premier League wants to do, as I understand it, is make sure that if you've got an extremely wealthy backer, they can't just get a company that they own to sponsor you at some ridiculously inflated sum of money, effectively subsidising you through the back door. Is, is that a fair summary? Yeah, that's a fair summary of the associ um, associated partner um, sort of transaction rules, um, associated party transaction rules. Of course, the, the real point of this is to enable a, you know, cost control mechanism to exist at all. Because fundamentally, if you don't have the rule that you're talking about here, which is effectively preventing owners from sponsoring their teams in in a sort of inflated type of way, then there's no point in having any um, sort of uh, cost control mechanisms at all. I mean, ultimately, Man City is owned by the government of Abu Dhabi. Um, and if, for instance, you didn't have any APT rules and the tourism board of Abu Dhabi simply announced one day we are signing a shirt sponsorship deal or a stadium sponsorship deal um, with uh, uh, Man City to the tune of um, £100 million a year, um, then that would be allowed. That would then all go into what's currently the PNS profit and sustainability system, in future the SCR system, so it would count as revenue, the same thing. And effectively, the rules would become totally irrelevant, null and void. And other clubs would say, well, why are we even trying to stick to these rules when they're being exploited in such a blatant way by a club who happen to have owners who have other businesses which can help them circumvent them in this way. So really, um, anyone who's interested in there being any rules at all were, you know, um, on the side of the Premier League on this one. And, and the, just in that example that you gave, Charlie, the 100 million, the assumption there is that that would be a ridiculously inflated sum. It would be effectively a way of funneling money into a football club if one of the companies related to the owners was subsidising you way above market value. And that's why market value assessments are made by the Premier League. Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, you've got to sort of start from the premise that in a normal situation where a non 
associated party sponsor would be making a shirt sponsorship deal in the Premier League and the marketing department of that shirt sponsor would be making a calculation based off the amount of exposure that that brand would be getting to the eyeballs around the world that watch the Premier League and watch that particular team, et cetera, et cetera, in the Champions League and, and all these things. Um, and that those values would be roughly consistent from brand to brand. Um, now, it's not so it's a slightly blunt tool because, of course, these things can be worth more to one company than they might be worth to another company. But there are experts in the marketplace who can calculate these things. And I think it's worth pointing out that when these valuations have been done by the Premier League's team of experts, they have always erred on the size of generosity towards City. They've always taken the view in these cases that City's sponsors derive a greater um, element of benefit than a normal sponsor would do. So they're already stretching it as far as you possibly can to let City fit in a general cost control mechanism. But what this is, quite clearly, is City saying, no, we don't want any cost control mechanism. So why are they doing that? Well, you know, in theory, it's because, well, of course, they want to be able to spend as much as they possibly can. But in reality, because UEFA are introducing their own cost control mechanism that City can't avoid under any circumstances, what this actually relates to is this big case, which is between City and the Premier League, which is coming up. Because if City could have thrown the entirety of the cost control mechanism into doubt, then their historic breaking and breaches alleged, which they of course deny, their, their historic denied alleged breaches of those rules could also be called into question on the basis that those rules don't really work and don't really apply. That's what this is about, or that's what this was about until they lost. Yeah, uh, until a, a few months ago, an independent tribunal, an independent panel found that a couple of aspects of APTs, these associated party transactions, were unlawful. They were only introduced in 2021. So the reason that the that there's been a vote in the last few days is because the Premier League has needed to strengthen those areas that the independent panel did find were unlawful. But City seem to see it as an opportunity to get the APT laws, the APT rules scrapped altogether. I'm intrigued well, as well. Newcastle yeah, United... Yeah, kind, kind, of kind of, Adrian. It was the most extraordinary situation. So Man City brought the case in the first case against the Premier League. The Premier League won on almost every point except for a couple of technicalities around how the rules were drawn up. The Premier League then said to the court, OK, we, we, we get it. We take it. Um, you know, we'll put our house in order now. And Man City said, oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. We don't want you to make the, 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 the rules legal. We want you to keep the rules illegal. Why? Because then when we get found, let's say, potentially could get found guilty of breaching them in the past, we can then turn around and say, well, these rules are illegal. Um, they don't really I mean, count. I'm intrigued, though. I, I, yes. I, sorry. Newcastle United were one of only three clubs to support Manchester City. I understand that. Newcastle United are run by an oil state, so they have the same incentive as Manchester City for seeing APT rules scrapped. Two other clubs supported City, Aston Villa and Nottingham Forest. What's in it for them? Well, I mean, uh, I, I think in in both of those cases, there are or have been recent brushes with these rules, let's say. So I don't know if you remember, but there was a sudden rush of slightly strange transfer activity last summer between some of these clubs to enable them to scrape under the various cost control rules. Now, in both cases, in Forest and Villa's case, their owners are inordinately rich, inordinately wealthy, and also between them own lots of different businesses as well. They're not oil states. They're not trillion dollar enterprises, but they are multi, multi billion dollar enterprises. And they're clubs which are trying to establish themselves as Champions League contenders, right? So Villa have just done that, I'm sure, much to your delight. Um, and and Forest are in, I think, the top seven at the moment, trying to get there, trying to do that. And they are gradually getting there, and they are sort of doing a good job of getting there. 
So effectively, they're competing for those places against clubs like Tottenham and Arsenal and Liverpool, who effectively run themselves mostly out of their own revenues. So they're trying to make up for the deficiency in revenues that they have with those historic big six clubs, effectively with owner injection of one kind or another, until they can get to the place where they are generating the amount of revenues that those guys are generating. So you've got a slightly sort of um, Newcastle, um, Villa and Forest are the clubs trying to join the top table with massively rich owners who see these rules as being ways of Liverpool, Arsenal and co defending their position. And City are the, are the team already in the, the big six who they suspect, perhaps not wrongly, that the other five members of the big six would love to kick them out, right? So it's a... I wouldn't say it's an unholy alliance. The more you dig into it, it's a natural alliance. The problem is there aren't enough of them. There aren't enough of them. And that's the biggest thing that has been exposed this week is that as all of these debates about all these things go forward, there are four clubs who are against the Premier League and there are 16 clubs who are for the Premier League and the Premier League executive only needs 14 to win these votes. And just to be clear, the Premier League's argument here, the reason they want these APT rules in is to preserve the competitive element of the Premier League. I mean, it's already at the top end seriously uncompetitive. There are brave clubs like Brighton and Hove Albion doing their very best to break into that top half dozen. But Really, if you look at who has won the Premier League over recent seasons, if you look at who has qualified for the Champions League in most recent seasons, it is from a handful of clubs. So the Premier League, I'm sure, is aware that if you make that even less competitive, overall, ultimately, the appeal of the competition will decline. Um, I, I'm going to gently disagree with you. I don't think the point of these rules um, is to make the Premier League more competitive. I think that the main point of these rules is to make the Premier League or to keep the Premier League reasonably sustainable, such as it allows a well-run club that does not have a massive, massive owner to have some chance of being able to exist within this competition. It's not really to enable Brighton to compete with Man United on spending. It's to enable Brighton to have really a relatively small number of teams who can massively outspend it, and therefore to enable Brighton to have access to the top seven, the top eight. It's almost like we have to accept that the big, the big six or the, big, the very biggest clubs have gone off into the distance, and they now generate of their own accord such huge revenues that actually it's ir it's impossible to concoct a set of rules that enable the rest of the teams to to catch up so the question then is okay but how do you enable the rest of them to carry on existing within this ecosystem in a reasonable way well the first thing is is to give them roughly the same amount of tv money as the top clubs which the premier league has done since its inception and the second way is to say well we don't want the big five or six to then become the big seven, the big eight, the big nine, the big 10, because ultimately then we're taking away even the faint possibility of West Ham winning a European trophy, of Leicester winning the FA Cup or the league, whatever it might be. It's, it'll become too big a block. Now, this is why these clubs say you are actually preventing us from competing against the top six. When I say these clubs, I mean clubs like Villa and Forest and, and so on and so forth. Um, you are preventing us from competing. These are anti-competitive because you're stopping us competing against the big six. But the alternative is this. The alternative is that all Premier League clubs would need to be owned by owners who basically didn't really care about how much money they spent. It would have to be either sovereign states or else basically some of the richest, richest people in the world. And it would be an arms race. It would be an arms race of unsustainability that would be subject at some point to potentially an enormous balloon going prick if any of these owners decided we can't quite afford this. Because if those clubs at that point were losing the kind of sums that we're talking about, hundreds and hundreds of millions a year, the air is quite thin in terms of potential buyers who could take over those clubs. So the Premier League are looking at this through two lenses, as are UEFA. How can we keep a semblance of competition 
whilst also promoting a degree of sustainability. Interesting. All this course of comes as the Football Governance Bill, pioneered by the last Conservative government, taken up by the current Labour government, has started its progress through Parliament. And Charlie, I just want to show you something here. This is something that I've come across. It's not easy to obtain, but I've managed to uh, dig deep into my resources to find this. And that is the 1999 majority report drawn up by the football task force led by David Meller. And it was looking at some of the issues that the football governance bill is due to look at. Now, there was a majority report drawn up by all of the stakeholders of the football task force. So the football task force had been concocted by the Blair government because there was recognition then that ticket pricing and merchandising costs for fans were getting a little bit out of order and that there was already signs of big inequality in football financially. So Blair's government commissioned this report. The majority consisted of the supporters organisations and also the independent observers, people like Herman Oosley, who died recently, and uh, a former commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. So it was the great and the good and supporters. This was in 1999, and this is what it said. The majority report offered football one last shot at self-governance. It highlighted the lack of unity in the game's administration and identified the creation of the FA-backed Premier League as the moment when a significant rupture emerged in an already fractured sport. It called on the FA to reform itself and create a football regulation authority, a new body capable of taking independent and objective decisions. This new authority would consist of eight members, four from inside football, a supporters representative and three independents with an independent chair appointed in consultation with the government. And this is me quoting, by the way, from a draft from my book, Where's the Money Gone? No one who reads the report could be left in any doubt about what it was implying, that the FA, which should have been a growling watchdog with sharp fangs, had become an obedient poodle answering to the commands of the Premier League. Had the majority task force proposal been accepted, the FRA would have created a code of conduct for clubs, held them to account over ticket prices and accessibility for young fans, Owners would have been forced to consult with supporters over stock market flotations and major share sales. A monitor and compliance unit would have been set up by the FRA to protect the game's financial integrity, weed out rogue directors and reduce inequality between large and small clubs. The ultimate penalty for non-compliance could be suspension or expulsion from a league or FA membership, or the expulsion of individuals from being involved in the clubs. And there was even a call in the report for the government to step in if its recommendations went unheeded. This is a quote. If in a period of two years, this is from 1999, sufficient progress has not been made to implement the specific recommendations in this report, we recommend the minister appoint a regulator by legislation. 1999, the independent panel created by the government came up with that recommendation. The only people who objected were the Premier League, the EFL and the FA, and they somehow managed to nobble the Blair government. What an opportunity missed. And so much pain would have been avoided and so much... Um, of the good that has been created during that 25 year period would have been put to much better use than it has been put to use. Because you have to look at this and say, well, 1999, the Premier League was relatively recent in its history, right? So the Premier League came into existence in 1992 with relatively small revenues at that point and very much, you know, the, the fifth, fifth biggest league in Europe at that point. And over the ensuing 30 years, it has turned into the great and wonderful beast monster that it, that it is now. Um, this was early in its history, and already the powers that be, and anyone who looked into it deeply, and I'm going to come back onto that in a moment, 
this this concept of looking into it seriously and people who take a more surface view of it. People who looked into it seriously just six or seven years after its creation could see the problems that were starting to amount within the national sport. And they made essentially the same recommendations then that Tracy Crouch made 25 years later, or actually exactly. that happens 23, 23 years later. So those who still rail against it, and it should be noted that whilst then the Premier League, the Football League and the Football Association argued against that, um, now the Football League have, are on the other side of the fence in arguing for it. The Football Association's view I've never quite managed to ascertain. I'm not sure that they have an independent view from the Premier League anymore. Because um, in as much as that report said that the Football Association had been effectively bought by the Premier League, that process continued apace over the following 20 years. Um, but the fact that the, that the Football League has jumped ship to the side of those who look very seriously at these matters, effectively isolating the Premier League, and in reality not even all the Premier League, about half the Premier League, um, as being the only significant sort of force arguing against it, tells you how much of what they warned against has become true. And uh, in 2008, the then Culture Secretary, Andy Burnham, so this is nearly a decade on from that majority report, warned football that it needed to reassess its relationship with money. And I've been delving again, some really fascinating news archive from that time. Lord Treesman who was then the chair of the Football Association, wanted to bring about a report effectively recognising some of the stuff that had been said a decade earlier in that majority report of the Football Task Force. And Treesman drafted up a plan which would have given the FA much greater responsibility to make sure that clubs were being run sustainably and that directors who misbehaved could be punished. David Conn in The Guardian, a great journalist, discovered that that proposal was never put forward by Lord Treesman, even though Treesman wanted to do it, because at the appropriate FA meeting where this letter would have been sent to Andy Burnham, it was said that Premier League representatives, quote, reminded grassroots football representatives that their money in many cases came from the generosity of the Premier League and it might not be in their interests to vote for what Treesman was suggesting and, and Treesman didn't then send that letter so the FA's official response was simply to say oh we support the Premier League and the EFL. Even then, the EFL was starting to get a little bit fidgety, it should be said, but the Premier League said to the government effectively we can regulate ourselves leave the status quo as it is and again an opportunity missed back in 2008 so let's track all this through to the parliamentary debate that started this week now oddly this bill started in the house of lords and the reason for that really is because the view was taken that it was already debated in the house of commons earlier in the year when it first was going through parliament so the next step in that process would have been that it would have gone to the house of lords so effectively, they started this one in the House of Lords and it will then be brought back to the Commons for a final debate. But they wanted to find out what their lordships and ladyships thought about the whole thing before the Commons had their next debate, rather than the Commons simply repeating their debate of earlier this year. So it starts in the Lords and Ladies, um, where, let's say, one of the contributors, um, Baroness Brady, Karen Brady, uh, effectively the lady who runs West Ham and a long-standing opponent of either regulation or more reasonable distribution of TV monies throughout the league. She said this. She said in the Lords, if we stunt the ability of the Premier League to maintain its growth and revenues, ultimately there will be far less investment in the whole of football, including the grassroots and the women's game. That would be a very bad outcome, <laughs> which is a precise facsimile of what that what of what the Premier League representatives were telling the FA committee all those years ago, which effectively is taking people 
who do have some responsibility for the broader game, including what they call grassroots, i.e. non-professional football, and in this case, the women's game, and threatening withdrawal of support for those elements of football if anyone does something that the Premier League doesn't like, right? Now, what is the nature of that support? Let's just take, for instance, women's football. What is the nature of the Premier League support for women's football? The Premier League has lent women's uh, Super League, effectively women's professional football Lim limited, has made a £20 million loan on favourable terms to that body to help it get up and running. Um, now, you might well say, well, that's, in, that's, that's, that's quite correct and, and very much in their members' own interest because Women's Super League 1 is entirely made up of men's Premier League clubs, women's teams. So effectively, that's the Premier League making a loan to an organisation which is owned by its own members. And that's fine, but not in all of itself. Obviously, a contribution to, let's say, the greater good, this is helping their own women's clubs get up and running, which is a perfectly reasonable, sensible commercial thing to do. And it's not a gift or a donation, it's a loan. Secondly, of course, the TV money that their, that their members receive through the central distribution is used in part to subsidise their women's teams, right? Because as we've discussed on this podcast before, women's teams lose money. Men's Premier League clubs don't necessarily lose money unless they want to. So there is some little slack on the side where we say, well, let, let's bung two or three million quid a year at our women's team to get that up and running. But let's not, let's not pretend that that's being done for purely altruistic motives, right? We've discussed before that the major sponsors of the big men's Premier League clubs have as part of their conditionality around their sponsorships that part of this money does get spent on women's football. And, and we've encountered that at Charlton as well in our discussions with sponsors. There is that demand that a club does have a proper women's team. And secondly, of course, there is the potential future value of those women's professional football clubs. You probably remember early this year, Chelsea um, put up their um, a, a portion of their women's club for sale at a valuation, I think, of something like $100 million. $100 million. Um, so again, this is this is about um, creating value. Um, it's about um, helping your commercial department sign bigger sponsorship deals for the men's club. It's about all sorts of different things. And that's how the Premier League supports women's football. Grassroots, as you noted earlier on, are supported through a series of grants to um, the Football Association and the propping up of the Football Association in various different ways. And effectively, that is what was identified 25 years ago as being the way in which the Football Association has ceased to be an independent regulator. So when Baroness Brady says, if you do this, then we will stop supporting the grassroots. Effectively, it's the old playbook. It's the old playbook. It's a way of saying to football as a whole, you cannot expect us to behave like decent citizens unless you let us control everything. Right. And that's not kind of. In irrational. It's not irrational to say that. The question is, is whether the rest of the industry, which is very much larger than the Premier League in all sorts of different ways, is willing effectively to be held hostage by the Premier League on the basis of what in most cases are very small grants. I mean, these are de minimis. These are a few hundred thousand here or there, maybe a million here or whatever it might be. But of course, for the Football Association, which is not a really much of a commercial enterprise out of the money, outside the money it gets from the England men's team, these, these sums are, are very important and, and the Football Association is still effectively run by the FA Council, which, is, which represents the independent county football associations throughout the game. And the, for these types of bodies, a few hundred thousand pounds here or there is make or break. It's, it's, you know, that's what keeps them alive. So it was laid out there in Technicolor by Baroness Brady in the House of Lords this week. No real proper argument about why it's a bad idea or, you know, what could be done instead, an alternative, et cetera, et cetera. Just the, 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 the arm fist and the velvet glove. If you don't do what we want, we will withdraw funding. But, well, there's a more generous interpretation of that, isn't it, Charlie, which is a, a phrase you'll hear. I heard Paul Barber, a Brighton chief executive, using this phrase on the Today programme on Radio 4 last week. You hear Baroness Brady use it. Lots of people. It's almost as though they've been given a template, which is that creating the regulator could cause, quotes, unintended consequences. Just to be fair to Baroness Brady and the people who say that, the argument could be that if 
the Premier League isn't allowed to be as strong as it can be and therefore generate all of this surplus cash that can be distributed, then that's why those grassroots organisations won't receive as much money as they do now. That it isn't a threat in the sense of we'll withdraw the money. It's a sense of you'll be, as again, the phrase goes, killing the goose that lays the golden egg. So let's just dig a little bit deeper into what they mean here. So Baroness Brady's speech in the House of Lords went on from there. And I'm just going to quote from it. Aspects of this legislation risk suffocating, just come back, come back to that word in a moment, suffocating the very thing that makes English football so unique, the aspiration that allows all clubs to rise and succeed in our pyramid system, the ambition that means fans can dream. Right? Now, I think we can all agree that that particular aspiration is something that people like you and me and everyone hold very, very dear. So why do the Football League want to get rid of parachute payments or at least significantly reduce them? And why is this the aspect of the bill that Baroness Brady and co are so desperately trying to keep? Parachute payments, let us remind listeners, if they need reminding, is the money that clubs that get relegated from the Premier League receive when they when they go into the championship of the Football League. And this and, and the sums we're talking about are basically around about £130 million over three years, right, in central distributed revenues at a time when the equivalent amount given to a normal championship club like, like West Brom would be about £20 million. So over the course of about three years, a relegated club gets £100 million. And West Brom and their other non-parachute payment clubs within the, in the Football League then have to try to compete against clubs who have £100 million more in revenue than they do. Is that really a system that supports the aspiration of all clubs to rise up the pyramid. I would, I would argue not. I would argue that that is very precisely, exactly the problem that we're trying to get to grips with here, is the aspiration for all clubs. Now, I think what Baroness Brady means and what she's referring to is the clubs already inside the Premier League. The clubs already inside the Premier League, their ability to rise up within the Premier League, as West Ham have done, the ability to rise up within the Premier League, reach Europe and win a European trophy. What a wonderful aspiration and ambition that was. And wasn't it wonderful to see West Ham do that, to have a different club on the big stage doing something absolutely exceptional. So effectively, what this small number of clubs are trying to do is protect their ability to rise up and do better, whilst preventing clubs below them from rising up and doing better. That is what the preservation of parachute payments is all about. In my in my view, and in the view of all the people who have written seriously about this topic in the past. Well, the bill is going through Parliament, whether they like it or not. And as it stands, and obviously this is subject to potential amendment, the new regulator would have backstop powers to deal with parachute payments. So we'll see if that survives the uh, parliamentary process. Charlie, thank you, as always. I mentioned the uh, 1999 Football Task Force report. If such things interest you, I do post occasional drafts of my forthcoming book, Where's the Money Gone? at my substack, which is adriangoldberg.substack.com. But I think that's a really quite a telling document and one that you won't find easily anywhere else given the passage of time i just want to say thank you to jed thomas for his help as always in producing this episode and to mark machado at eleven twenty nine for our socials one final word so if you're watching this on youtube don't forget to hit the subscribe button so that you don't miss an episode and equally if you're listening on Apple or Spotify or another streaming platform, make sure you do subscribe so that you can listen to every episode. Charlie, great to speak to you. See you again next week. Cheers, mate. Thank you very much. Bye.